This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFawn. Mitch LaFawn. Welcome to another episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFawn here on Westwood One. And this episode, oh my lord, this episode. Uh, let me just bring in Alan Niven because I think we're going to have to uh, explain this together. And, 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 and I know I'll be a lot more excited, I would imagine. But uh, Alan, bonjour, bienvenue. Welcome to Le Rock Talk, as we say. Bonjour, Mitch. Bonjour. So we have got... Uh, how would we describe this? Uh, a blue light special, a, a stuffed pinata, a what? What? Listen, it's a great episode. That's how we're going to describe it. From it's, yeah, it's another really good episode of Rock Talk that you've put together with your contacts and your skills. But this one, I sense, has a particular significance to you because it involves a member of Kiss, and if I'm right. I might be guessing that this is the first time that you've interviewed Paul Stanley. So it's a big deal to you. And yes. explain that to me. It is. Uh, I have interviewed every living member of KISS in the past multiple times. Ace Fraley three times, Peter Chris twice, Gene twice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I have met everybody in KISS, including Eric Carr and Mark St. John. But I have never had a chance to have Paul on the phone. And I had many chances. That first interview when I was 11 years old with Gene Simmons, it was actually supposed to be with Paul Stanley. And the day before or two days before, they phoned and said, Paul is unavailable. Would you mind doing Gene? Listen, I'm 11 years old. I don't mind doing anybody at that point. Um, And then there was a time around the hits a hot in the shade tour where there was supposed to be a backstage interview and Paul had broken his ribs, I believe in Pittsburgh or something like that. He broke, he broke his ribs or he wasn't feeling well. And so that got cast aside. And then when I worked for brave words magazine, I had done all the lead work, got an interview contact. This is around like 2004 or 2003, either when they were on the, that tour was Aerosmith or when they were coming along uh, doing the uh, the sheds in the summer with Tommy Thayer in the band for the first first time, or, or the Tommy and Eric, I should say. Um, and I, I did all the legwork. I got the interview. Everything was set. And and literally before the phone was going to ring, I got a oh your editor Martin Popoff uh, decided that he wanted the interview for himself, and since he outranks you, he gets it. And I was like, really? Well, that's kind of shitty. Uh, you know, it, it, well, here you are. <laughs> you, you, you finally got him, and, and I finally got him. So, I, is so, it not, is, it, is it not a good bookend? Because isn't this coming up the end of the world? The final end of the road, world? right? The final kiss. So for you, you. find you finally get your last kiss med, member right when they're going out on what is going to be apparently the last time. Um, yeah. and believable at this time that it's the last time. Yeah, yeah. so it's going to be the last tour, which, which I, I'm actually very excited about. And it's funny because during the interview, Paul talks about bucket lists. And, and I'll, I'll reveal this, just, and you'll, you'll hear it in the interview. But he said, I, I don't have a bucket list. I don't cross stuff off. And it was funny because I was literally looking at a list of interviews I want to do, you know, Ozzy, Axel. And I was literally crossing off Paul, and he goes, I don't have a bucket list to cross stuff off. And I was like, oh, well, I'll just not cross this off then. We'll just put that to the... <laughs> so no, no, anyway, it, it was a it was an incredibly fun chat. I think it was incredibly honest, um, you know, uh, and I asked him about topics which I think fans will like to hear about, and, and certainly I wanted to hear about, and I don't think I've heard other media's ask them whether it's a CNN or a Rolling Stone or some of the higher end uh, interviews they do. So to me, it's a very unique interview. It was all over the place. We covered the entire career. We, we talked about a lot of different members. So, you know, sit back. It, it's 40 minutes long. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, after that, I've got Jakey e. Lee, who, of course, used to be with Ozzy's band. He was in Badlands with Eric Singer, who happens to be in Kiss these days. Um And Jake revealed a whole bunch of stuff, which was uh, fascinating. They have a new album out, or Red Dragon Cartel does, called Patina. And then to round it off, because those two aren't enough, apparently, 
Uh, Wolf Hoffman from Accept, who, of course, opened for Kiss back in the 80s. You see, it's all everything. The whole world is Kiss related. That, that's just how it goes. And Great White opened for Kiss. Yeah, you see, yeah, you trade. And, 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 and we'll get to that in a second. And Paul Stanley almost produced that first uh, Guns N' Roses album. We'll, we'll talk about it. So it's all related with, with Kiss, but um, except have Symphonic Terror live at Wacken 2017, or like some people take to say, it's not Wacken, it's Wacken. Well, whatever. It is Accept Symphonic Terror. I've had a chance to hear that album as well, uh, and it's it's really kicking ass. And, and the Red Dragon Cartel folks, uh, Patina, comes out November 9th. I've heard the advance. You will love that. The guitar tone on that album is just spectacular. But uh, Paul Stanley, Mr. Niven, when when you were working with the band, was this whole Paul Stanley going to be a producer thing part of your experience with the band? Or did you come in later? I mean, obviously, you didn't come in before. And then so, no, it must have been. Were you part of those conversations? Uh, no, I wasn't. I, I, that um, was a flirtation that occurred before um, I was involved. Um, and God, you'll have to forgive me, but the uh, gentleman who owned Patch Studios and who um, produced Quiet Riot was working with with them guns um, when I came on board. So I, I did not... Uh, did not get to meet Paul or talk to him about producing a record at that point. Ah, oh, well, that's that's too bad. I, you know, I, as a fan, you think, well, that would have been a great combination, this and that. But when you lis- listen to the result of uh, Appetite for Destruction, as it was with with Clink and with, you, there's just no going back. I, I don't care if it was Paul or or, or Gene Simmons or Eddie Van Halen, uh, the way it turned out now with the guys that did it, I mean, honestly, could, could you think of it being anything else? Uh, absolutely no, and I think it's one of those rare moments where you can look back and say, oh my God, we all actually got a decision right. Mike Klink was the right guy, and working with uh, Thompson and Barbiero was a good move too, and good Lord, we actually made two good decisions. Um, the results speak for themselves. Yeah, and that uh, Thompson Barbiero team that went on and did Tesla and and all these other, I mean, just what a fantastic uh, injustice for all. Just what a, what an incredibly fantastic team. And um, uh, just just quick, the, the the guy from Quiet Riot there that you're thinking of, unless I'm mistaken, is Spencer pa- a Proffer. Absolutely, and thank you for reminding me of the name. I I feel awful if I can't remember a name, but I am getting to that point where I got big holes inside my head, um, to quote a line from uh, Wasted Rock Ranger. Um, there you go. I don't, I don't always remember everything. Um, and maybe I am guilty of why I have s- some of those holes in my head, but uh, uh, thankfully you're there to remind me. Yeah, good old uh, Spencer Proffer. He, he, was, he pretty much was... 80s rock or 80s hard rock for for a few years there from at least what 81 to 87 or 88 he was he was the guy right Passion well quite right quite riot's um success at sales was not anticipated um no one really saw that coming and whether or not you're a major quiet riot fan or not you still have to doff your cap and acknowledge the fact that they broke through in a big way in sales, which changed the mindset of a lot of A&R departments in Los Angeles um, and laid a little bit of a path for a lot of a lot of other bands to follow. Yeah, and uh, I remember one time long ago, since we, everything is connected to KISS, that somewhere around 81, 82, when they were doing the Creatures of the Night and stuff, apparently, uh, having spoken to Frankie Benelli, uh, the members of KISS or Paul or Gene had phoned him and said, hey, would you like to come and audition? And at the time, he, he, he declined because I think he was getting on with Quiet Rider or something else. And so everybody here has some kind of connection to KISS. And so shall we just get into to Paul Stanley? Because it is 40 minutes long, and it's, to me, a very special interview because of the personal connection, the fact that it, it, it is the last member of KISS for me to interview, and I, I, 
it, it's remarkable in my head that I, I've interviewed everybody who was in Kiss. I mean, that's that's just like bizarre. Well, I, do, I, do, I, I do not often listen to the interviews before you get them done, but I, I did get an opportunity to listen to this one. And if you're a Kiss fan, it's well worth listening to. And Paul is a lot more open and articulate than maybe some of you expect. Yeah, I, I was I was uh, pleasant. Or I, how, how can I put this? I don't want to say pleasantly surprised because that sounds dismissive. I was very thrilled with his answers uh, because there are there are very easy answers to give, and whether it's Paul Stanley or, or Brett Michaels, or you know, you you say, hey, this album's this, and the tour is that, and and it's all nice and nice and nice, and and he just gave me really very honest and open. Uh, answers and, and very appreciative of that and so uh, here we go folks here is the one the only the man you've been waiting for Paul Stanley we are speaking with Kiss frontman Paul Stanley of course the band is officially heading out on the road for the one last Kiss end of the road world tour Paul an absolute absolute pleasure to talk to you a, a long time dream have been a fan since 78 I'm sure people tell you this all the time but uh, Thank you for agreeing to be here today. I never get tired of hearing that. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. And and I will say this, and I'm sure the fans will agree, just thank you for 45 years of dedication and devotion to your craft and just always putting the best foot forward. Just much appreciation for what you've given us, both musically and just in our lives. So uh, a quick thank you, and then we can start talking about the tour. Thank you. Uh, the first question on this, and it's to me it's the obvious question, when we talk about a last tour, an end of the word, uh, world tour, what does it mean for the band in terms of an entity? Does Is it you're just not going to tour anymore, but there might be some one-offs, you know, if the Super Bowl calls you or a charity event calls you, do you go to it? Or is it really, this is it, we're done, KISS as an entity will no longer exist? That is a very, very all-encompassing question. Yes. And I don't know that uh, I, I – it's not that I'm not prepared to give you an answer. I don't know um, the, the, the specifics of the answer that I can tell you. I can tell you that for us, first of all, this – this end of the road is you know, certainly there are people who are um, somewhat jaded uh, and thankfully they're in the minority, but uh, for the people who say, well, you already did a, a farewell tour, uh, that tour was 19 years ago, 19 years ago. Bands don't last 19 years. Um, and when we did that tour, it really was because the members of the band were miserable. I was miserable. Um, it seemed like the best thing to do was to put the horse down, so to speak. Um, it wasn't until afterwards that it became clear to me and should have been all along that the band should continue. It was just the misery of being with the the members at that time was, was just overwhelming and and turns it into drudgery difference this time band gets along great we see each other we spend time together we look forward to being together um it's just reached a point where we needed to have an end game in 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 place it's just if we were on stage in track shoes and jeans playing rock and roll songs that would be yeah we could do that into our forget about 70s we could do that into our 80s but we're carrying around 30 40 plus pounds of equipment whether it's boots and guitars and and what have you and running around and making it look pretty easy so we it just became I think the elephant in the room became bigger and bigger, and we just needed to uh, to look at each other and say, "How are we going to how are we going to 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 put a cap on this?" So 
I think this made a lot of sense. And uh, the end of the road is absolutely the end of the the band um, touring, doing anything um, with that kind of regularity. It's it's uh, we want to go out and do the the greatest show we can, and we virtually have thrown out everything that has been on stage um, for the past 10 years at, at least and created a whole new stage and a whole new new show so this really is the the best show we could do under the best circumstances we we're we're not crawling to the finish line we're celebrating yeah, and it's a great celebration. So, okay, so let's talk just real quick about that about the farewell tour. Mm. To me, Kiss has been sort of unfairly targeted because the Who retired in 1981, and 37 years later, they're still doing it. Ozzy, of course, retired in '92. He's still doing it. Kiss retires, and for some reason, there's a different take on it. You somehow lied to the fan base, which is totally ridiculous and, and and I'll be the first to say I'm glad you're still here. It's nice to have kiss in my life. Um talk to me about that in the sense that really what was the 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 issues that that you had to say okay, we have to sort of walk away. Was it just were the were the two band members just beyond um there, there was just no getting along with them? Yeah, it 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 fell back to all the things that were wrong to begin with, and a lot of animosity, a lot of resentment. Uh, you know, there, there there is that old adage: if you if you don't learn from the past, you're you're you know doomed to repeat it. And uh, it it was really it was horrible. It was horrible to try to get people. Forget about on stage. How about trying to get him to the lobby? You know, it it it, it wasn't fun, and there there was a, certainly a a a, um, a anger and resentment about finances and why we weren't equals. And I'll tell you why we weren't equals because. Uh, two of us kept the band alive after the original two had gone, and we we toured relentlessly and worked at our craft. And uh, you can't come back in, and, and everything goes back to what it was. But mm-hmm. it it it's short sighted when somebody is more concerned with how much I'm making rather than how much they're making, especially when it, it's really just a matter of it, it's degrees of wealth. And there are certainly people who are wealthier than I am, and I don't lose any sleep or I'm, I'm not envious. We, we were all blessed. And for whatever reason, uh, family members, friends, just poisoned the well again and from having people come back swearing that they would never make the same mistakes again and how grateful they were to be back it turned into the same situation and short-sighted i think i certainly looked at it and thought we we just have to we have to end this but it didn't mean as they say, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that's basically what we were were doing. And once that tour was over, it wasn't too long before someone came to me and said, I love the farewell tour. When are you going out on the 40th anniversary or whatever it was? So that's when the the light went off. And I realized that uh, we really didn't have to adhere to something just because we believed it when we did it. Yeah, and and I'm fine with that. And I I saw the the 2004 tour, 
It was spectacular. The, the set list, the, the band, it was great. Uh, talk to me quickly about your fan base, because there, there really is no such thing with other bands as the KISS fan base. When, when polls come up, KISS versus Iron Maiden, KISS versus this, the fans are there. They discuss you at nauseum, uh, the good and the bad. But even when they're negative, there's still a great appreciation and a great love. Um, what is it about the KISS fan that is different than the Rolling Stone fan or the Who fan or the Led Zeppelin fan where it, it's not just a band that you talk about over lunch for, you know, with a friend. It, it, it really is almost a lifestyle. I think the difference is for whatever reason, it's the difference between being a band and being a phenomenon. Phenomenons impact society. Bands make music. Um, we have managed to touch a nerve and to be a touchstone and a an important pivotal part of a lot of people's lives. So for whatever reason that may be, whether it's music or, or people uh, feeling a, a connection emotionally, uh, there, there's something unique about KISS, and it it elicits very strong reactions, positive and negative. Uh, back to the, the idea of uh, the the farewell tour, the only people who bitch about that are people who don't like us, for whatever reason. Uh, but I, I never started doing this to live within the boundaries that anyone else set. The, what made the band unique was that we we followed our, our own hearts and we followed what we wanted to do. Uh, so living within the boundaries or limitations that other people set, I don't really care who it is. It's it's not it's not in the cards. I love when we connect with people and they love what we're doing, but part of that. Uh, connection means that we have to have the freedom to do whatever we want. And likewise, you have the freedom to either be a part of it or not. I, I don't uh, necessarily think that all the music we have done meets with everyone's approval. And I understand you have the right not to buy it. You have the right not to come to shows. Likewise, I have the right to do what I got into this in the first place to do, which is follow my own path. In fact, I, I do want to talk to you about following your own path. Once the the tour ends, whether it's in two years or three years, or even if it's in 10 years from now, where does that leave Paul Stanley? Do you, you know, you had Live to Win in 2006. Um, do you come back with another solo album or are you happy just sort of to retire to California, take care of the rock and brews, and that's it? Or do you still have that creative urge to put something out, to get a solo band together, to, 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 to have your own radio show? Um, where do you go from the after tour? Well, doing solo albums, doing Live to Win was an interesting one because, again... I don't know that everybody uh, embraced that album. And I did an album that I thought was almost the opposite of my first solo album on purpose. I didn't want to, I, I, I wanted to avoid doing that, that album again. Would I, possibly want to do an album like that in the future sure if i did another album would it be guitar driven absolutely um that being said i spend five days a week now doing art uh my the success of my art at last count was over 10 million dollars so i love being creative in that way for me, life is about finding um, outlets for my creativity, and 
that's how I define myself. So what will I do when uh, there's no more kiss? Well, there's loads of things to do. Uh, I'm not a believer in bucket lists. The, the whole idea that you cross things off your bucket list and, and you want to get them all done, I believe that every time you cross something off, you should be at a point where something else comes on the horizon. So for me, art is a big, big part of it. Um, I'm in Vegas right now for the launch of um, my Puma shoes, which are already sold out. You can't get them. There's wait lists. So life's exciting. Um, it, it may sound corny, but uh, for me, every day I wake up is uh, a, a new challenge and, a, and new possibilities. So yeah. what am I going to do after this? There won't be a vacuum. There are bands out there who tour incessantly because they have no lives, because they're nobody when they go home, because they don't think they're anybody to begin with. So really, I, I bask in the spotlight. I love being on stage. I love doing my best to give everybody what they came for. But it, it, it's, not, it's not everything. I have... I have a great life and and a terrific family and great friends and I don't that's not my drug and for a lot of people who are out there on tour nonstop it's it's because they have nothing else going on. I got loads of things going on. And and that 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 is actually a fair assumption. Um Talk to me a little bit about the business of Kiss, because as we head into the into the end of the road tour, the farewell tour, for the lack of a mm. better word, I'm assuming there will be Kiss product, and of course, there's always T-shirts and 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 you know buttons and all that stuff. We love that stuff, but will there be any kind of you know remastered a live album with bonus tracks? Well, is there you know, musically? Are there any sort of things for fans to look forward to? Will there be a sort of a slew of, you know, remastered the Asylum, remastered this? Where are we in terms of that kind of product? We're really at the beginning of something that is only taking shape now. Um, It's all looming ahead of us, and the first line of, of business and the first order of, of uh, priority is this new show, the set list, and getting out there on tour. The rest will come, but it's kind of like asking somebody what chapter five of a book has when you're only on chapter one. I don't, I don't know. We'll know. Everything all will be revealed. It, it to me too. I, I'm not holding anything back. I'm not trying to uh, um, con you with with uh, expectations. I know that with time, more will come come about. What it is at this moment, I can't tell you. the The first line is to make sure that this show, and it is, will be the greatest show we've done, a completely different spectacle, uh, and the band uh, in terrific shape. I can't wait to see this. Now, uh, many fans, of course, are hoping that at some point, whether it's in New York or Chicago or L.A., that Ace Fraley will show up or Peter Chris will show up. Or for many, Bruce Kulik, they, you know, they love that 80s kiss. Um, do you see a time where you might have guest appearances from other members, or is it really, really the four and that's it? Anything's possible. Okay. I, if if I've learned anything, it's that anything is possible. Um, this is absolutely a celebration of Kiss, the entity, the the beast. And its history and everywhere it's been. 
as far as uh, individual members, anything's possible, but that's certainly not what this is. This is a this is a victory lap of everything that Kiss is, and that for the last twenty years or so, I think is is pretty close to that. It is is the band as it is now. Eric's been. I've been playing with Eric. I think it's twenty-seven years. Yeah. So, and, and personally, my favorite drummer, and and I'll just go aside for a second here. I would love to see him get back to his revenge era drum sound with the double bass and the whole thing. To me, that was just epic, and I would love I would love to see him go back to that. Well, he's he's a phenomenal, phenomenal drummer, and. Uh, Anybody in the business knows it. There, there's certainly enough guys around who are quote unquote metal drummers. Um, you know, uh, pick pick uh, your terminology: um, thrash drummers, uh, blues drummers, rock drummers, whatever you want to call everybody. Eric can play anything. He grew up playing in big bands with his dad, and He's just, he's, he's so deep in terms of what he can and can't do. Uh, when he plays in Soul Station, people hear him and don't know it's him. He's just, he's so, so solid, and, and his musical vocabulary is amazing. And he's just a killer, killer singer. Yeah, which is a great addition to the band. Um, totally. I- I, I do want to focus just real quick on the 1980s. Uh, you know, the 1980s, from music uh, from The Elder all the way down to Hot in the Shea, we went through a whole bunch of different band members, from Vinny to Bruce to, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me about that period for the band and for you specifically. There, There is a perception, and correct me if I'm wrong, that for, for some of that era, Gene had checked out, and Kiss really was just you. And if it wasn't Paul Stanley, we wouldn't have Kiss today. Um, what were some of the challenges for you during the 80s? And, and how did you manage to keep it afloat, given all the changing members, the changing tastes on MTV? The, it, it, just talk to me about that period for, for you in the band. When I hear, well, if it wasn't for Paul, there wouldn't be a Kiss today. That I can't, I, I can't embrace. But... Was I the the sole consistent and constant in the band for um, a decade or so? Yeah, absolutely. And was it for me? It was more about my love for music and my love for Kiss. It it uh, it didn't always seem fair. Uh, Sometimes it was a real tough struggle, either um, in terms of uh, personalities and and feeling let down, or just the 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 changing of, of personnel in the band. But at the bottom bottom line, and at the end of the day, it was about my loving my band, my loving what I do. And I think of KISS as my band. It, I hope other people in the band think of it as their band, but I unapologetically say, you know, this is my band. And if people take breaks or, or, or take shore leave, I'm still going to be... I'm still going to be in 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 that uh, ship, and if it if it springs a leak, I bail water. That's just that's I'm not doing that for anybody else except for myself. Were 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 there moments though where it wasn't water you wanted to bail, but it was you that you wanted to bail, where you might have said, "Listen, I need a partner in this, and if I'm not going to get one, then I got to go somewhere else." Did it get to that point where? It almost was done. No, 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 because I would never, I would never leave. As I said, 
in my mind, this is my band. If someone doesn't want to be there, then you can leave. It, it would it would have been very very difficult and 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 uh, changed everything dramatically if uh, if Gene for whatever reason had decided to to leave. But I can't. I, I'm not. I have no power over anybody else. I I can't. I can't tell anyone else at the end of the day what to do. People make their own decisions. The only person that I have total control of is me. So I can say without hesitation, I would never. Uh, I never was never contemplated for a moment leaving the band. This is my home. This is, this is, uh, I built this. And when I say I, it's not negating uh, other people, but I was part of this and I, I'm not leaving. Well, well, and and that's good news. Um, I know we only have half an hour, so let me just get these couple of questions in here. Uh, the reunion tour in 1996, uh, personally, I got to see 11 shows because, you know, that's what fans do. Uh, talk to me about that time. Was there a hope that it was going to be more than just a tour and it was, here are these four guys and we're going to ride into the sunset again and we're going to all be friends and make albums for the next 10 years? Or did you go into it thinking, this is going to be a great tour, it's going to be a great money maker? How did you sort of approach it? With a lot of hope for the future or really... Business is business, and, you know, how, how did you sort of look at that reunion tour? There was a, a huge emotional component in it. I was, uh, I had high, high hopes for it. Not not unrealistic hopes, because everybody was still the same people, and everybody's uh, ability within that context hadn't necessarily changed, maybe diminished some, but I thought, yeah, here's an opportunity for four guys who went their own ways to come back together, which is amazing in itself, to come back together, reclaim our place, and go forward smarter and wiser. And it seemed there was a there was more than a glimmer of that when we first got together and it, it was very exciting uh unfortunately it didn't last uh yes i i was not i was not looking at it once we got back uh together as a a tour as much as a possibility to pick up where we left off smarter and uh, with our lives and, and with what we had accomplished in better perspective and to to seize the moment it just it just fizzled and became awful and that was was pretty baffling to me it, it was really sad and uh it was a, a huge disappointment. Well, yeah, I, I'll, I'll share that disappointment. Uh, and then I guess since we're running out of time, just, just quickly on the Psycho Circus album. You know, it, it was this reunion album. And then, of course, uh, I remember specifically putting it on myself thinking, you know, I think that's Ace playing, but I'm, I know that's not Peter playing. Uh, was there Was there a hope that you'd have a full reunion album with four functioning members pulling four, you know, their parts? Sure. Okay. Sure. The, the idea was not to go in and have, uh, they have ringers in the studio. The, the idea was to put an album together as a band. And a few things were, were unfortunate. We, we had wanted to work with Bob Ezrin, and Bob wanted to do it, and scheduling 
became uh, conflicted. So we lost out on on Bob, who I think would have been a, a huge, huge help in the process. And then on top of it, we had uh, we had people who were really leaving all their decisions to attorneys. And we wound up in studios where basically Gene and I were looking at each other and we were getting messages of, of uh, parameters and requirements and all kinds of things from, from legal teams. And on top of it, the producer, Bruce Fairburn, really didn't want them playing um particularly peter so it was it was not it was not a great a great environment and again i just i took as much of the reins as i could even as far as at one point when uh our producer was talking about leaving the song psycho circus off the album and um some other things that i really felt were were way off track i said you know something this is my whatever it was this is my 20th kiss album it's your first and i'm going to have to live with this and you'll go on to something else so i'm coming in over the weekend and doing what i want and um i have to try to put this as i think it should be so I did my best under very I, I did my best as we would say under duress it was it was not a great situation and it was very symptomatic of the the decay and and how much deterioration there was from this promise of a a reunion that really seemed to have huge potential well Unfortunately, it 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 fizzled. You know, yeah. it's 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 like those those uh, shots that you see on TV where a missile or rocket takes off with, with all this propulsion, and then as it gets in the air, it just kind of like goes haywire and either hits the ground or blows up. It uh, it it started with a for me all kinds of possibilities and and just became absolute drudgery and that's that's sad but at at that point i came to realize once again that the band must continue and the band is bigger than anyone in it when we just yep. played spain and portugal to 30 50 whatever thousand people they came to see kiss they came to see everything that kiss stands for um, and that's what they got, and that's what everyone will get on this tour is Kiss, a band whose DNA is in every live show of every band that's out there. Without us paving the road, there would be loads of bands not driving on it. Yeah, and it, it's amazing that over the years all these critics have taken shots, and yet you look at the bands like Anthrax and Motley Crue, and all, they all pay homage to you. John Five, they're, everybody's about how Kiss influenced them, including myself. Uh, and then I'll just finish with this in, in the thoughts of Psycho Circus, though. How refreshing was it for you when you came into Sonic Boom and you came into Monster and you had four teammates or three teammates with you that all played along, all contributed, all wrote, all sang, all played. Um, was it? Were those nice experiences to those last two albums? They were. They were magical. Uh, I don't kid myself. There's no way that anything that we can come up with or anything I can write will ever have the impact, at least initially, that those songs that are part of people's soundtrack of their lives will have for for everything great 
that modern day Delilah is for everything great that Psycho Circus or Hell or Hallelujah is, it doesn't have the importance in somebody's life that Love Gun does. So those songs, as great as they are, and as terrific an album, for example, as um, Sonic Boom is, where the four of us really, really um, contributed and and created that album together, it, it can never have that magic because the magic goes far beyond the members or even the songs. It's about a period in your life. And I can't recreate that for you. And I'm not that person either. So for me, the idea of trying to imitate what I once did wasn't the point. When we went into the studio for the last two albums, it was to reclaim the, our essence, not to make believe it's 1976 or 75. So doing those albums was really, really fun and really great. And I love, I love those albums. Um, I think they, they have the vibe and the spirit of those earlier albums, although they could never have the impact. They, they just can't. It, it's not those days anymore. And that's true for virtually every band that's out there. There, there are moments in a band's lifespan that stand out and everything that comes after is not of, of that same, you know, uh, Ilk or whatever. impact or yeah. importance. Yeah, and, and you're right. You know, you, you can make the next great Kiss song, but you can't play it to Mitch at 15 because that doesn't exist anymore. So, you know. Right. Right. Uh, and then uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll finish. I, I said it twice now, but I'll be remiss if I don't get just a quick quote about Eric Carr because I know the fans love him. I was at the July 25th show uh, in 1980. I saw his debut. Um, just quickly for the fans, a, a few words about Eric Carr and what he meant to you personally and both professionally. Eric was a breath of fresh air. Eric was somebody who brought a missing spirit back to the band of, of somebody who was immersed in the wonder of being in the band and uh, this connection to the fans. Uh, he loved the fans and he loved the band and he also um, brought to us bands that we weren't listening to, that he he was. Uh, that being said, Eric was also somebody who was troubled and never really felt that he was the original drummer. I, I, there, there's no argument for that. You, you're not, but you're the drummer. You, you, you have taken over that, that lofty position. So, um, there, there were times where he was conflicted or we were conflicted. Um, his death was horrific and, 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 certainly uh something that affected me greatly and i never had to deal with something bef like that before and had i i probably i'm sure i would have done some things differently but i was there a day or two after his his first surgery and um the, some some issues happened over time between uh, his feelings of, of being cut cut out or um, issues with his family and um, things that uh, were were unforeseeable and and 
you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. But at the end of the day, I never thought Eric would die. I never had to deal with anybody I knew dying. You might be sick forever, but it was illogical. But I uh, couldn't really imagine him him not being here. That said, he was a huge contributor to the band, and uh, when when people say that the band wouldn't be here today without me, I likewise have to say I don't know that the band would be the band it is today had Eric not been there. Yeah, and that's and that's a great great comment and a great place to 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 end this. It's it's absolutely perfect. Uh, Thank you for today. Thank you for 45 years of absolute enjoyment and, and, and fandom and, and nuttiness and great music. And uh, I cannot wait to see One Last Kiss, the end of the road world tour. And of course, I will have to see it probably 12 times like I did the reunion tour. Uh, thank you. Just thank you for everything. Well, interestingly, I, I've seen it, it uh, in print as One Last Kiss. That has nothing. I don't know where that came from. Okay. It really is. It is the end of the road, um, and okay. I couldn't couldn't be more happy to be doing it as proudly and as gratefully to be surrounded by Gene, Tommy, and Eric. It's just uh, it's the perfect way to do this, to do it with smiles and with our heads held high. And with a fan base that's very appreciative. You know, when, when you, there's the new album and the new this, there's always people complaining. But when you know it's the end of the road, now it's just time for everybody to go and have a good time, celebrate, and forget all the discussions about who's the better this and who. It's Kiss. It's fantastic. And just go enjoy it. Well, thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Bye-bye. You're listening to Rock Talk with Mitch LaFawn. Rock Talk. And a very big thank you to Paul Stanley. Well, in fact, let me say that again. A very big thank you to Paul Stanley. Holy mackerel, that was great. Um, wow, we, we, we've done it. I, I've managed to interview all four original members. And as a older man who's still 12 years old on the inside sometimes, it's, it's amazing that in 1978, I... I st- stared at these album covers like they were superheroes and now anyway that's a whole different uh, it's a whole different thing but uh, i'm sure you understand i understand um for me it was the back cover of alice cooper's love it to death that had that visual impact yeah and there's and i think there's a similarity actually uh, that uh, you know when i when i first saw the cover to dress to kill i went Ooh, this looks interesting. Um, you know, the, a certain photograph can inspire that. It really uh, can. Ross, well, Ho- Ross Halfin took what I thought was the definitive image of Guns N' Roses. And you look at that picture and you just go, I want to know more. Well, I know one that, that you might have that reaction to. As you know, I was pitched an interview with Mary and Faithful, and, and it hasn't happened yet, and I don't know if it will. I certainly would love to. I'd love to talk about the Metallica and her career and stuff. But when I mentioned that to you that I had been pitched that, there must have been a couple of pictures of, of hers or album covers that you might have gone, yeah, it's pretty good right there. I'm I'm down with it, right? She's- oh, absolutely. You're talking about one of um, the queens of my fantasies as a, as a kid. And then later in life, she came out with an album that I still think is absolutely incredible called Broken English. And that album is one of my favorite albums by a female performer. And you see, that's that's what I like about the show here, this rock talk, is that we can get these stories from 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 artists like Marion and, and, and of course, Paul. And and I've got some some other interviews with Tony Dolan of Venom Inc. and, and Pat Stewart, who was uh, the drummer on Brian Adams' Reckless album and Carmen Apice and J- um, Jeff Pilson and I don't know why I was going to say Jason. Uh, Jason Pilson. Uh, no, but Jeff Pilson. It's just nice to not always have to do the same music style and just the same driveways. It's nice to, to, to park the car some, some other places sometimes. So hopefully that Marion Faithful happens. I think that would be a great 
a great chat and just, you know, broaden the horizon a bit. Yeah, the only thing I'd say is that's one to definitely prep well for. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, she is a very sharp and astute woman. I can imagine. And and she's got a new album coming out, which, if I'm not mistaken, I, I listen, I haven't done the research on it yet, but I think it's been like 24 years or something like that since the last one, so... Uh, that will be interesting. Anyway, let's hope it happens. Finger, fingers crossed. I would love to get her on. But uh, I do have Jake E. Lee on. His band, Red Dragon Cartel, is very much a band now. The first album was him and a bunch of guest singers. And so it had, like as he describes it, a piecemeal kind of feel to it. But this one is definitely a band. And I've heard the album. It comes out in November, November 9th to be precise. I think it's just great. There, there's a great, you know, when you when you get albums to review, a lot of us will play like you know 30 seconds of the songs or a minute of the song and then move on to the next song and sort of just get the gist of it. This one I put on and I just let it play all the way through and I didn't have this urge to skip forward or stop and 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 that's that to me is unique and rare, especially in this day and age where our attention spans are all very sort of skewed and short. I enjoyed it. Will I enjoy it in 10 years from now? I don't know. But right now in the moment, I thought that Patina was a fun album to listen to. It provided a great night of entertainment. So, but Jake, well, Jake yeah, Jake, Jake he is, he's, he's obviously a really good guitar player. And I mean, you know, anybody who names their first band after a Tommy Bolin track, uh, his first band is called Teaser. That is an indication right there of somebody who knows what good guitar playing is and has taste. And he was also in a band called Badlands, um, who did some dates with Great White, and um, that was kind of intriguing to me on, on another level, in that the bass player, Greg Chasen, used to work in the Green World Warehouse when I was um, working as a, uh, a sales and marketing manager in that company. And to bump into Greg backstage was like, oh my God, you know, we both looked at each other and said, wow, fantastic, great to see you again. Um, and it, it goes back to a time when the South Bay of Los Angeles was a real little hot spot with a real genuine scene to it. I think, you know, anybody who's into rock and roll history may look back and go, you know, that was an interesting place and time. Um, and in particular, I remember one particular building there, which was, uh, I should send you a photograph, it's 401 Gentry Street. Now in England, when somebody of notoriety has lived in a house, they put a blue plaque up on the outside of the house to say so-and-so lived here at that time. And it's kind of entertaining because that building um, housed Bobby Blotzer, uh, George Lynch was living with Bobby for a while, and that was on the left-hand side of the duplex. And on the right-hand side of the duplex was Mick Brown, Don Dorkin, myself, and my then wife. Um, so we had some real interesting parties there, and uh, I think you might even be able to see the blood spots on the driveway outside where Jack Russell beat the hell out of a guy called Paul Shortino. Um, who I think was connected with Jake Ely as well. So small world, yeah, very small world. I think, and of course, Paul. Uh, Paul now is in Vegas doing the. Um, oh, what's that show in Vegas called? Uh, I forget what it is, but it's one of these rock shows where they they just sing all the '80s hits and stuff. And he, he joined Quiet Riot for a while, and I believe Juan Cruchet was part of the guy from Rat was also part of that little ensemble because I know Rat, Juan often talked to me about hanging out with Don and being at Don's place and staying on the couch kind of thing, so... Yeah, and Juan's wife used to look after my plants in my house. <laughs> she'd, come, she'd come... Yeah, because I'm notoriously deadly to plants. Um, and I love having them in the house. And uh, Juan's wife used to come in every Monday and make sure I hadn't killed them and look after them. <laughs> That's great. And, and by the way, since we're talking about back then with Don Dawkin... Uh, we did mention that Jakey Lee is a great guitarist, and he is, but Don, before he really sort of turned into the lead singer frontman, he really was an accomplished guitarist. He would wail, too. I mean, you must have seen him back in the day as Don the guitarist and not just Don the singer. Uh, 
actually with Don, um, my most profound impression of him was Don, Don the songwriter. Um, his composing skills um, were very evident to me, and I learned a lot from him. Um, he, Don was actually the first person to take me into a studio and do some work, and uh, I learned initial production from Don. Um, you know, That's but right. we were a small little group there. Jakey Lee was in Mickey Rat for a while, if I'm right and yeah. remembering. Yep. And and he was in Rough Cut with Paul Shortino, um, whose blood is still on the driveway. <laughs> so let's 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 uh, let's get to Jakey Lee because at the end of it, you might say there's some blood on the driveway. Um, halfway through the interview, towards the end, he starts revealing stuff. Uh, that is very, very intriguing. I don't want to say shocking, but, you know, we were having a nice little interview, and then all of a sudden he starts talking about this and that, and I'm not going to reveal it here because I want you to go listen. But it's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and he even says during the interview, he goes, maybe I shouldn't have said that, or maybe I shouldn't have gone there. And it's like, um, yeah. So, well, uh, let's, go find, let's go find out what he shouldn't have said. Yeah, let's go, let's go listen to that. It, it, is, it is fascinating. And uh, here it is on the heels of the Paul Stanley interview. Here is the one, the only, from Red Dragon Cartel. The new album is Patina, out in November. It is Jake E. Lee. By the way, who is the drummer in Badlands? Eric Singer. Eric Singer, there you go. We are speaking with guitarist Jake E. Lee. Of course, the band is Red Dragon Cartel, and the new album is Patina. It comes out later this year in November. Uh, And Jake, I have had a privilege of hearing an advanced copy and i will say this for the record it is spectacular i i you know when you get a promo copy you listen to like 30 seconds and then you move to the next song i didn't do that i sat through the whole thing on the first listen just wow well done wow wow thank you no i, yeah. I appreciate that uh but yeah i think um to me, it is it is an album. It isn't a, a collection of songs. It's uh, I'm glad you said that because I do feel like it's something you can listen to from beginning to end and not want to skip forward because it's it's not all the same thing. It's a uh, it's a uh, hmm. well it's it's okay. I'm gonna put it this way because I don't want to scare people right. when I say that there are hints of jazz and surf and punk and uh, psychedelia in it i i imagine that would scare people off but it's all under the umbrella of hard rock and i look at those and i just came up with this analogy like five minutes ago it's it's kind of like a steak like i like my rock i like my rock hard i like my steak to be a ribeye and it doesn't mean that um, I don't go for a filet mignon every once in a while, or maybe put a Bernays sauce on top of it, or have it cooked blackened, Cajun style. All those are variations on what I really love, which is a, a good steak. And I like to think of uh, this album kind of like that, where where I say that we have all these these sprinklings of of jazz or whatever. It's all still basically hard rock, and I think it adds to it rather than detracts from it. Now that I said that analogy out loud, I don't think it was that good of a one, but uh, there you go. No, but there, there, there are moods and shades going out through the, through the entire album. Uh, you look at a song like Crooked Man and Bitter, which of course the fans won't get to hear until November, but there, there's just a lot of stuff going on, a lot of... I, I had it on with my headphones on, you know, I've got these nice high class headphones and there's just stuff filling up the space. And I love it. I, I just love that effect. Um, talk to me though, about the band Red Dragon Cartel. Cause when you first came out in uh, 2014, you had Robin Zander, you had Paul Diano, you had other people singing and I had taken it more of, here's a Jakey e. Lee solo project and he's got these different singers and it was great. It was fine. But this has really turned into a band. So, or that, my opinion is that what we're going for in this one? This this is sort of the band moving forward. It is. It is. You're you're 
correct. Uh, when I did the first record, it was uh, Kevin Churko asked me, um, well, originally he asked me uh, what it would take for me to play with Ozzy again, because Kevin had been, uh, he had done the last, he produced the last couple of Ozzy records. And uh, that was his initial question. And once we went over that, uh, he asked me if I would be interested in making music at all. And he offered me his studio and he said, just, just write something, come up with something, see if it feels good. I'll provide the players. And the first song was a uh, feeder, which had Robin Zander on it. And uh, so that, that's what inspired me to go ahead and make a full record, but it was all done that way. Very piecemeal, very, uh, here's a part, here's another part. Let's put it together in, in the studio. Who would sound good singing on this? Uh, here, let's get this drummer to play it. It was, um, it was more put together uh, on the spot. And it wasn't till we're nearing the end of the record that I realized if I was going to tour it, I needed a band. And that's when I started looking for a singer and a drummer. And uh, they were able to do a couple of songs on the first record. But yeah, it was uh, the first record was very piecemeal. Whereas this one was done front to back from the writing stage, which uh, we would have the whole band in a rehearsal room. And I would come up with ideas and then we'd work on them there. And it it was done very much in the fashion that I would have done it 25 years ago with Ozzy, uh, with Badlands. This was much more of a band effort uh, from front to back. And and it, you can really tell that now, um, Darren, the singer, I, I'm friends with Darren. When I heard Patina, I actually texted him and told him, quote, it fucking smokes. That's that's the quote I sent him. Um, <laughs> talk to me about Darren, because we all know he was in. He was out. He was in. He, we had that little drama or whatever you want to call it. Uh, talk to me about that situation where things worked out and, and now he's back in. And, and I do think, and I will suggest, of course, I'm biased, but I do think that he mm-hmm. fits these songs perfectly. He, the voice fits the music perfectly. But talk to me about sort of that situation of in and out, in and out, and now he's my guy. Okay. Um, well, there was only one in and out. <laughs> First off, it uh, he was the singer. He was as soon as I heard him uh, it, on his audition tape, I knew that voice. That was the voice I wanted to work with. So we were, we had the band going. We were on tour. It, there was an issue that was uh, more of a personal thing between me and Darren. He never actually quit the band. I never actually fired him, but we agreed until we could work out the problem that we had, that it was best that he not finish the tour with us. So I got other singers, uh, other singers got lined up. Um, I didn't uh, like hire one for a week and then fire him and then hire another one it was worked out from the beginning where I think there was four singers where each singer got uh, an equal amount of time out on the road with us. And uh, I considered them uh, like substitutes. Uh, They were substituting for Darren while we worked things out. And I, I wouldn't, wouldn't consider that any of those singers were ever actually in red dragon cartel. Um, Eventually, Darren and I worked out our personal problem, and uh, uh, he was always the guy that I wanted to work with. I think he has a fantastic voice, and he's gotten a pretty bad rap because of the first, well, the infamous whiskey show, right. where he, he fucked up. He knows he fucked up. Everybody knows he fucked up, but he's been judged off that one performance ever since. And, um, I always knew that he was an amazing singer and he was the one I wanted to work with. So once, once we, uh, clarified our positions, uh, he was back in the band and he finished, uh, the last tour with us in California and in Japan. And 
I I do think this record proves why he is the singer for Red Dragon Cartel. And I always knew he was, and a lot of people were skeptical about that. But uh, he, uh, if you listen to the record, he's 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 fantastic on it. And agreed, fully agreed. And I and I do think uh, some of that also is on the first record, uh, the few songs that he sang. He was. Uh, I'm not usually around when the vocals are being recorded because to me it's boring <laughs> i don't want to sit in a room and listen to a singer sing a song over and over and over again i'll just listen to it at the end of the day and okay it or nix it uh for that first record he said he was being pushed to scream more and um and make to make it sound more rock and uh one of the first things that anthony said once he was in the band and and he played the shows with Darren was his, his voice is so much better than I thought it was on the first record live. And I said, yeah, yeah, he is. He, he, he doesn't really sound like he, he does on the first record. So on this record, I think it's a much more accurate representation of what Darren's voice sounds like. Cause we didn't, we didn't push him to scream. We just, uh, went with it. And, um, I think anybody who listens to it has to agree that Darren's a great singer and uh, I hope people give him that chance. Yeah, they really do. And and after that, that infamous show, I actually interviewed him and you, you can still see the interview up on, on YouTube and he, he did a full mea culpa. I mean, he said, listen, I, I was not prepared for that show and look, we all have bad moments in life. So, but this album, he really, proves that he's the singer and, and, and he's not screaming and it's sounding great. Um, there was a time, though, where you disappeared from the scene. And there's a famous quote or there's a quote that, that I pulled out from 2014 where yeah. you said, you know what? I just ha- I just had the need to make music, but I didn't have the need to make other people listen to it. Talk to me about that time. Why did you not feel the need to have your creative output shared with others. Why did you say, okay, you know what? I did all these tours. I did the Badlands. I did the Aussie. I did all this stuff. Now I'm just going to go be me, make music for me. And what was that sort of retreat about? Uh, Well, I, um, uh, after the end of the eighties, um, and the whole, well, Badlands got lumped into the hair metal thing, and I, I don't agree with that. I don't think Badlands was anything like the hair hair metal bands of the '80s, um, but I got lumped into it, and uh, you know that left a really sour taste in a lot of people's uh, uh, mouths. Um, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't cool. It wasn't cool to have been a part of the '80s once the '90s started happening. And and I get it. I get it. Grunge came along, and I you know Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, those were awesome bands. And but it 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 made the whole scene that happened before it look kind of silly. And uh, I couldn't see myself getting away from that. Um, I was being lumped into it. Uh, I tried to work with some other people that were a little more current. um, And they just, they, they said, yeah, you're a hair metal guy. We're not interested. And um, I've always, I've always kind of, changed a little bit every time I come out with something uh I did Ozzy and that was wonderful and I did some really great music in that after that after four years of doing that I wanted to change a little bit so I came up uh with Badlands with Ray Dillon and it was more of a blues rock more of a my roots sort of thing and I got a lot of responses that were negative for that. I mean, um, because it wasn't metal. It wasn't what I did in Aussie. And I didn't like being trapped in that. And uh, after Badlands, I I did a solo instrumental record for Japan called A Fine Pink Mist. 
And I was very proud of that. But that that pushed off into another direction because I'd just done the whole blues rock thing for four years. And I got a lot of uh, pushback from that. Like that what happened to I thought I thought Jakey e. Lee was either a metal guitarist or a blues rock guitarist. Now you're presenting us with this whole other side. And it just seemed like everything that I did, because I didn't want to repeat myself, uh, I got a smaller and smaller audience. And after the whole grunge thing, I felt like I had no audience at all, really. And I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to be that guy who kept trying to push himself onto people. Um, I didn't want to be the, uh, the old man in the bar trying to pick up young chick. Right. Um, and so I decided to bow out and, uh, keep whatever dignity I had left. And, um, but I still loved the music. I was still a musician. And so, and because the advent of computers, uh, the whole, where you can record by yourself, that, that made it so much easier for me to get out of the spotlight because I could still make music. I could still write songs. I could still have it. And, and without involving anybody else. And so that's, that's, just the way I felt for a long time until I got talked out of coming, uh, coming out and well, not coming out. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but, but sort of hitting the stage again and whoever talked you out of it, you know, thank you because, you know, we love our, 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 our rock heroes and our, and our guitarists and stuff. And, and it's nice to have you out here and it's nice to have red dragon cartel. But let me ask you about those recordings. Cause you did say you were sitting at home, you were making these recordings. It was easy to do. Is that stuff that you you used on either Red Dragon Cartel album albums? Is it something that if you haven't, that at some point we might hear, you might finish them, or there are songs that are finished that you might release? Because I think there certainly would be a curiosity and an interest to hear what you were doing. Um, I'd say the bulk of uh, the first Red Dragon Cartel album was made up of what I had been doing for the past fifteen years. Uh, a lot of that, that first album was, um, <clears throat> it was, uh, they would take songs that I had on my computer, transfer the guitar parts uh, onto the computer at the studio, and then add drums. You know, Cherko would say, hey, let's get this guy on drums. And it, it was taken from my computer and then added onto it. It was very piecemeal. Uh, process uh bit by bit um put together and yeah uh, the majority of the first red dragon cartel was stuff that i had been working on and there's still a couple of eh, a couple dozen probably other ideas on my computer but for the new album i didn't want to do it that way i wanted to go back old school and do it with the band in the room uh, working on the songs and it, it, I think it manifested itself in a much more immediate and live kind of a feel. Um, I mean, you can tell right away if, uh, I come up with a riff and then the band joins in and we're working on it, whether, whether it feels right or not. Uh, it's not so easy to do when you're by yourself on a computer in your room and you like what you came up with and it's not working, so you keep on trying different things because you have all these things available, all the software available where you can uh, work on it. In a live situation, which this record was written in, uh, it, it's, it's, the impact is immediate. Like, yeah, this, let's say for the Havana, the Havana riff, when I first played it, I wasn't sure if it was a good riff or not. I thought it was. And but once the band came in and we're playing it and and we stopped, everybody's like, oh no, that that's great, that's a motherfucker right there, and it's it's uh, I, so that's the difference between the two records. The first one was more piecemeal. This one was more of a live situation. And, and you and it and it 
you can really hear it when you play it. And and I particularly like the guitar tone. I think the tone that you that that goes through the record is just great. Um, all right, you you mentioned Badlands, so so let me just quickly ask you about that. Uh, but the the album in particular, you know, when it comes out. It, it 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 you know it, it draws a little bit of attention. People like and stuff. But then after a few years with Eric Singer joining Kiss and and Ray, uh, unfortunately passing away, all of a sudden it becomes this revered album, uh, and it's a great album. Uh, talk to me about your memories of that, and and just also a little bit about Ray because he he was just such an incredible incredible talent. Um, what are some of your memories about making? that album and, and working that album uh <clears throat> yeah the first uh, yeah the badlands it was uh hmm. it was uh an incredible experience it's uh and i i do um agree with you where when it came out it, it really didn't sell that well i mean i don't think well Obviously, it never even went gold, which back then <laughs> was a failure. And uh, it, it didn't sell as well as uh, the record company was hoping. And it, But I, I still think it was a fantastic record. And Ray, I do believe, was one of the greatest rock singers of all time. He didn't have a, a, a lot of time to uh, uh, put product out. Um, but I think it's obvious from, from what little he was able to do before he passed, uh, he, he was an amazing singer and I was lucky to be able to work with him. Uh, I, I will say one thing <laughs> that I find interesting after all these years is, uh, when we were doing the first record in New York, uh, after the drums and the bass was put down, it was time for me and Ray to put our tracks down and we both show up every day and I would put stuff down and I, I think maybe two or three weeks on, I, I was, you know, making good headway on the record, putting guitar parts down, but I noticed there was no vocal tracks yet. And so I, I sat him down. I said, Ray, what's going on? How come you're not putting anything down? And he said he was nervous. He said he wasn't sure because he'd gotten a lot of hype before that because he was in Black Sabbath for a short amount of time. And and he was an extraordinary looking guy. So he had gotten a lot of hype about being uh, the ultimate front man for whatever he was going to do. And he he was afraid that once he actually committed to the tape, and people heard him, maybe, maybe they would think it was all hype. Maybe he wasn't as good as he'd hoped he was. And I just, I just found that ridiculous. I mean, cause I'd heard him sing and, and I told him, dude, you're fucking amazing. You're the best singer I've ever fucking worked with. You're better than almost anybody out there. I, uh, if, if you don't think you're that good, then trust me, trust me. I think you're that good and, and just go in there and prove it. Uh, and, and I think within the next day he started recording, but I just think it's a, it's weird that somebody that good would have doubts about himself. And he did, but I think, uh, he proved himself wrong <laughs> yeah i think he did actually um real quick back to to red dragon cartel the first album of course comes out 2014 the new one is coming out in november of 2018 right the easy math is four years now that the uh -huh. band is is more solidified we've got darren it's not a piecemeal thing like you, you described the first album do you do you see yourself putting an album out like in 2020 and sort of getting on a more regular touring album cycle of every sort of two years kind of thing or there's no thought of the next album yet there's no thought of it's just we're going to put this one out we'll tour come talk to me i mean do you sort of see that an album touring cycle thing start for the band now that it's more of a band i i view it as more of uh the latter i the latter of what you said uh it's not hmm. 
No, I don't. I don't have any long term plans. Um, I approached this last record as it possibly being the last uh, music I ever put out, and it that's that's why it took so long to make. I, I made sure that everything was as good as it could be from uh, from the songwriting to uh, the recording of the parts to the to the mixing to the mastering. I viewed this as possibly my last ever. And um, I, I don't know if I'm going to make another record. I might, I might not. I, I, I take it day by day. And uh, let, yeah, let take, it's, it's, well, let me ask you about but, that. What, what, what is going to sort of spur the decision? Is it, is it album sales? Is it age? Is it getting along? With, like, where do you sort of, get that urge from to make another one like if this one sells gold you know 500,000 copies do you go yeah okay that's motivation enough or is it well Darren and I really got it all great on the road that's mo like why, why sort of feel that this might be the last one and what could motivate you to make a next one well I don't think it's a bad thing that I consider everything I do as being no. the final one no 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 it, I'm not, it, not suggesting yeah. that yeah <laughs> No, no, I know you're not, but I, I just want to point that out. That uh, I think it, it it motivates me to make sure everything I do from here on out is uh, at the top of my um, abilities. Game. Right. And, and um, what would motivate me? I I've, I can't say it's purely album sales, although although that would be inspirational uh if if a lot of people loved this record and and there was proof of it in sales that surely wouldn't hurt uh but it's that it's it is age um i mean i'm in my 60s and i know there's other people that are in their 60s and and they're out there doing it um but it uh Touring, for example, touring hurts a little bit for me at this point, and it's it's uh, partially because of my age. I've always had back problems, and so it can be physically painful for me to go out on tour. I want to do it. I love touring. I love playing live, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do that on this record, but uh the scene has changed even within the last four years uh it's it, there there's not as much money and that's not the motivating factor for me it never has been uh but you have to be able to make enough money to uh pay everybody and and uh, i'm hoping we can do it we're trying to work it out uh uh right now there's nothing definite and um like i said it it uh it can hurt for me to tour and i'm not a pussy so you know i'll drink a bottle of jameson go on stage and that has never affected my playing i i i remember one sanazi in chicago it's somewhat legendary i was really really i barely remember the show cuz my because of my back, going back to my back and, and the problems I had in Aussie, there was one time where I couldn't even move. I, I was leaning up against the amps. It was the beginning of the show. It was time for the solo and the first song, and I'm still leaning against my amps. I, I managed to push myself off, but it hurt my back so much, I didn't move after that And because I was on painkillers. And then I saw that the monitor man had a bottle of whiskey next to him. I said, let me hit that. And I hit it, hit it, hit it, kept feeling, feeling better and better. And eventually, I, I don't even remember the show, but I did listen to the, the board tape the next day to make sure I didn't fuck up. I, I still play flawlessly. I, <laughs> it's, I don't know if it's a talent, but I, I, can, I can be, uh, this, this is not going the way I thought it would go. Um, <laughs> what? No, but it was, but it wasn't. Basically, I'm. Right. I can be wasted and I play great. Right. It's it just, it's just something I can do. And I did that somewhat on the last tour to get over the pain. 
Um, and, uh, Hey, I don't mind doing it again for this tour, but it's going to take its toll. So, um, we're, we're doing it day by day. Hopefully, hopefully we can tour on this record. I would love to be able to tour on this record. The songs I think lend themselves, uh, more so than the first record to being played live because of the way we wrote it. And, uh, uh, it would, I would love to go. I, I love the guys in the band. I would love to go out and tour and we're trying to make it work. Yeah. And, and what I would love to see for the band, if, if, you know, promoters are listening, I think Red Dragon Cartel is a perfect European festival band or a festival band, even in the stage where you, you get a nice like six o'clock slot and you just come in there and you warm up the headliner, and I think that would be perfect, and I think that'd be a lot less painful than a van going from club to club, you know, in in Ottawa to Idaho kind of thing, and and and, and, and right, and and the band musically, you have the chops and you have the songs, and you know, it's 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 great stuff. Um, I know we said twenty minutes, we're at half an hour, so I'll I'll respect our time. At, at some point, you know, would love to do a second interview. Uh, we didn't touch any of the Aussie stuff, but I think fans can google enough aussie jake interviews that they don't need more quotes about about you and aussie but uh great stuff <laughs> right bark at the moon ultimate sin you're playing you're playing live i had uh, carmine um on the phone yesterday i was chit-chatting with him about some stuff um just great memories of that of that stuff from my perspective as a fan seeing it seeing the videos uh so thank you for that and uh folks do do go by patina it is a fantastic record. I, I don't normally um, sit down all the way through. You know, you listen to 30 seconds and you just sort of get an idea. This You can't do that to this one. This, this one is a player. You got to play it all the way through. Uh, Jake, great pleasure to talk to you today. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I, I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. And hopefully we'll, we'll see you on the road. Hopefully. And yep. if I'm drunk or not, I'll still play well. You'll you'll play well. You're you're fine. People love you. People love your playing. Just get out there and do it. And uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cheers now. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Now back to rock talk with Mitch Lafon. And a very big uh, thank you to Jake E. Lee, of course, Red Dragon Cartel Patina, and I, I will repeat it. It comes out in November. I have heard it now. I enjoyed it, and I think if you're a hard rock fan, you will enjoy it as well, and I certainly hope you enjoyed that chat. But let us move on to a man who has an incredible hairdo. I love exactly how he, how he keeps his head just like mine. <laughs> I love it. That's, that's, that, is, that is the hairdo and the hairstyle of virile, well-meaning, strong, fabulous men. And so Wolf Hoffman of Accept. Well, talking of, talking of Virile Man. <laughs> yes. Um, are you supposed to do a Blue Chew advert today, or are they not on the schedule today? They are not on today's schedule, but of course uh, they were on the schedule the last two weeks. And if you heard those, uh, I do encourage you to go check out that product. Of course, uh, Blue Chew. Oh, so we so. Gi- we're giving them a freebie today, but y- yes. yes. Um, Little Blue Chew dot com. So- Who, why not? One of the ironies of life is that finding how many ladies like no hair, and we spend so much time talking about guys who had more hair than you could possibly imagine, but there are those women who would like to hear somebody say, make it so, Yes. referring to Picard in Star Trek. Ha. Um we love Picard. Now, of course, in the 80s, we had hair metal, and as, as we've all gotten older, it's now no hair metal, which is, which there is, you even, go. Which, <laughs> which is even better. But, but Symphonic Terror Live at Wacken uh, 2017 is the new album, and guess what? It also comes out in November, November 23rd. So as we head towards the Christmas season, listeners, start saving your shekels uh, because you've got Red Dragon Cartel to buy, you've got Accept to buy, and by then, you will have Kiss tickets to buy, because I, though I can't tell you exactly when, because that wouldn't be nice, but the uh, Kiss tickets and tour will be announced somewhere between the airing of this show and the release of those albums. Huh? There you go. How's that for a tease? 
But um, except, you know, did now you, did you ever do anything with Great White or Guns N' Roses with except opening or being in the building or on a festival, or are those are are those ones not part of your experience? Well, 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 in a way, we're back to it's a small world after all. I wouldn't have to paint it though, but it is a small world in that. Um, uh, a couple of connections there. We had Udo Dirk Schneider open for us um, at the Felt Forum in New York. Um, so it was interesting to see Udo again because um, Michael Wagner, who worked on, I think the album was called Balls to the Wall. Uh, it was certainly the track I remember most vividly from that record um, for, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but I think the album was called Balls to the Wall, too, but Wags had, It was so titillating. Uh, yeah, well, Wags, Wags mixed that record, apparently, and uh, Don had introduced me to Michael to work on the first recordings we did with Great White, and um, David Geffen used to say that if you don't exaggerate your resume, you're not trying hard enough. And I was always under the impression that Wags had produced that record, um, and come to find out later that he mixed it. But it's a small world, and that was where Except crossed my path. Back in those days. And, of course, for me, yeah. uh, again, it was back in those days, on that balls-to-the-wall sort of tour cycle for them. In early 84, they were in Montreal opening for Kiss, which would have been, I guess, the Lick It Up tour. And, uh, yeah, so that's where I first saw them. And, of course, after I, I saw them and then, you know, you'd go watch Much Music or MTV in the States and you saw the Ball to the Wall videos and so on and so forth. And I was like, oh, OK, interesting band. They, they, they've they managed to stick around for all these years. But what I really find impressive about them is that the second half of their career with the new singer Mark Tornillo really seems to have taken off and established them as a whole new brand and a whole new uh, entity. You know, it's not very often that you can change members and create a whole new excitement and a whole new entity, and especially when you change the voice. But for many, many fans, uh, Mark is the voice. And the, this new version, and it made me that, I don't know if that's a, a good term for it, but this new incarnation of except is what people are very, very, very excited about. And it's it's great to see that a little, I guess he's a Jersey boy, was able to to do that with this band. Uh, so, you know, anyway, Symphonic Terror Live at Wacken 2017 comes out November 23rd. And uh, anything else to add, Sir Alan, or because we've been so long with Jake and so long with Paul and all our, con- maybe it's just time to jump in. Let's get on with the Wolfman Hoff. Yes, let us get on with one of the greatest heavy metal guitarists out there, the one, the only, Wolf Hoffman. We are speaking with Accept guitarist Wolf Hoffman. The new album coming out in November is called Symphonic Terror Live at WAC in 2017. That is, of course, November 23rd. Uh, Wolf, absolute pleasure to talk to you. Hey, same here. How are you doing, Mitch? Good, good. It's been a couple of years since we, we've last done an interview, but... Just just a great fan of the band, and especially since you've had Mark come into the into the folds. But uh, let's focus on this symphonic terror. Talk to me about putting this show together, because, you know, it's to sort of plug in the Marshall amps or the amps and turn it up to 11 and, and play fast as a shark and balls to the walls. You've done it. You've been there. We, we know how it works. But what was it like sitting down with a symphony and and getting this at whack and just, just the whole sort of organization must have been incredible. Yeah, man, it was a trip. I have to say, I mean, first, you know, it, it, it pretty started, it pretty much started like a, like an idea or a dream that I've had years and years ago when I wrote, um, you know, my solo album, um, Headbanger Symphony. And I thought, you know, I'd really love to see what it would sound like with an orchestra and, and see what the guitars and hear what the guitar sounds like, what it all sounds like if it, an orchestra plays along. So, you know, my friend Melo and I wrote, wrote all these orchestrations for that album. We finally recorded it in Prague and it, it turned out really well. I thought, you know, that was really a, a lot of fun. And then the next step, when we announced the show at Wacken, it was like, 
why don't you guys play some accept songs with an orchestra? So one thing led to another. And then, so we started writing these orchestrations and, and it, I have to say, I was amazed at how, how well it came together and how these orchestrations really blend with the accept songs and how, you know, it, it, it really worked a lot better than anybody could have hoped for. Yeah, it, it, it really, really does. And in fact, so so talk to me about this, because you've had these flirtations with classical music, of course, before. You've done the album Classical back in 97. You did head, uh, Headbanger Symphony a couple of years ago. Talk to me about your fascination with the classical music and, and how does it sort of relate to hard rock or heavy metal? You know, I was never fully aware of it until we actually did this whole project how many influences there are and are how many classical influences there have been always have been our way of songwriting because a lot of those melodies that i play on guitar and a lot of that stuff that we wrote even 30 has some sort of classical inspired lines in them and now that we put that to an orchestration it really makes you realize wow it sounds like it was written for it but it really wasn't it was all written for guitar the orchestra plays it it, it really sounds like it was meant to be that way. That was this, the, the amazing realization. Yeah, it really was. Now, now you, you were breaking up a little bit uh, in that answer, but uh, we'll, we'll keep moving forward here. Uh, is this something that now it's sort of one and done, or can you see yourself uh, in the next couple of years picking a few select cities, whether it's in L.A. or Berlin or whatever, and... and presenting this show again or was it enough of a challenge where you said okay we've done it we've got it on tape the album's out let's keep moving forward no as a matter of fact we're planning exactly that right now we're planning to do some select cities in europe and actually across the world to where we're gonna a different or yeah play a different version of that same show obviously wacken is wacken and you know we had this huge stage and we had a 50 piece orchestra there so right now we're trying to schedule shows that are all across Europe and, and, and where we do the same set list, only in a slightly different, you know, different venues first and foremost, and then with different orchestras around the world. In some cases, we are planning to take our own orchestra along, and in, in others, we have to uh, use local people. You know, obviously, when, you, when you're talking about flying to Russia or Japan or places like that, you know, you're not going to take orchestra players along maybe just some key players but the rest will be local players obviously but that whole thing is a logistical challenge of course as you can imagine and that's what we're going through right now yeah, trying to figure it out so uh, the the dvd of course and the cd does include uh the live segment from headbanger symphony where you decided to bring the solo album to this Talk to me about sort of the satisfaction of getting that. Because, you know, when you make a solo album and within a popular band like Accept, it sometimes gets overshadowed. But here was a chance for you to not only make that album, but then have a chance to perform it in front of, what was it, 80,000 people? Just just talk to me about that yeah. thrill, right? Because, I mean, it's, it must have been a great thrill. Well, yeah, of course. Like I said earlier, I mean, from the moment that we played this in the studio, there was always a plan to maybe one day bring it out on stage because it's kind of a natural thing, you know, a symphony orchestra, you want to hear that, you want to see that on a big stage with a big production. Um, so when the chance presented itself to do that at Wacken, it was like, man, that, that would be amazing. And it really turned out to be amazing. Of course, the logistics, like I said earlier, are quite challenging. We had to, you know, only a very short time rehearsal with the orchestra and really pretty much had to, to depend on everybody's professionalism to pull it all together because in a, in a, on a festival situation like at Wacken, you know, you, like there's usually no sound check. There's not, not a lot of preparation time for you. You basically got to jump up there and do your thing and hope it all works like you had planned, um, you know, and that's exactly how it went down. You know, everybody was kind of nervous and, you know, it either works or it doesn't. And it did. And, and but it, it was, of course, it, it was a dream come true, of course, man. That sound on stage when you're in front of all that, that was one of those moments I don't think I'll ever forget because the sun was setting and, you know, 50-piece orchestra behind you and it all, 
it was like a bucket list moment in a way. Yeah. Right. And of course, it's Wacken or Wacken, however you say it. It is the premier heavy metal festival. And I don't mean to insult all the other festivals, but but Wacken is the one. And so to do this there is just sort of extra yeah. special, right? Um, let me quickly talk to you about Andy Sneap. He, of course, produced the last four albums. Incredible, incredible producer. Really brought the sounds to accept that needed to be brought to the band. His guitar playing and stuff that, that you know, his his uh, his musical knowledge is also very well appreciated. Of course, now with Judas Priest, what does that mean for Accept? Do you do you look for a new producer? Do you sort of find a moment where the two schedules meet? Where do we go from Rise of Chaos? Do we, right new guy wait around? What's sort of the plan for the next new studio album? Don't really know yet. Uh, I think we'll just play it by ear. I mean, we want Andy to produce it. That that far, that much is a given. Um, but whether he will have the time or not, I can't. T- I can't say. I- I'm hoping he will because I can't see him touring forever and like nonstop. There's always always going to be a few weeks here and there where we can meet and do this. Um, but quite honestly, we aren't there yet, and we'll see when we get there. Um, but that's that's the plan to keep working with Andy because he's he's really perfect for us. So, you know, hopefully he'll find the time to do it. Yeah, and I, and I do want to explore that because I do think he's he's perfect for you. But from your perspective, of the band perspective, what does he bring to the studio that enables you to create albums like um, Rise of Chaos, Blood of Nation, Stalingrad? Because it really is sort of an, another level in your performance and, and, and album making. Well, he brings a certain amount of comfort because, like, we know each other so well now. You know, initially when we started working, we had to feel each other out, like always, with a new guy or a new producer. And at that point, in particular, like, you know, in 2009 or 10, it was, he was very much the right guy at the right time, saying the right things, pretty much, you know, because at that point, we didn't really know how Accept should sound and what kind of songs we should present. And now that we have a new singer and a new era starting, like he was very helpful to sort of guide us in the right direction. And that is classic old school songwriting with a new sound or up to date sound basically. And um, now that we've done that four times in a row, or actually including the live album, several, I, I think he produced six albums for us by now or mixed it, you know, mixed and produced everything since 1910. So, uh, and in 2010, 1910. Well, 1910 yeah, would not, be, not, you're not you're that not classic that of a band, right? <laughs> we're working on it, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> right, the 100th anniversary um, tour, that, that'd be a yeah. spectacular tour, but okay. <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, you know, there's really, I mean, he's really the guy that we feel very comfortable with because he's done it since the rebirth of accept with us. So yeah, he really has. Kind of us. Well, I was going to ask you quickly because you did produce headbanger symphony. If for any reason, Andy wasn't available, would you consider yourself to produce the next accept album? Or are you of the mind that no, it takes ears from outside the band looking in to sort of offer guidance and, and subjectivity and, and, or if push comes to shove, you'll raise your hand and say, okay, I'll take this. I don't know yet. Um, we're not there yet or ever. I mean, so far it's worked the way that it has been working. And, and yeah, there's, you know, sometimes you, you end up doing more of a thing than initially you think you were going to do. And, you know, but at this point, I mean, we really have a, a formula that works and I don't, think i ever want to be a full-time producer or or fully in charge myself i think it's more of a team sport to be honest and it always helps to have somebody from the outside giving your objective opinion and you know andy is great at that and he gives us a great sound so i don't see no reason to even think that way Right, and when that, and that's good to hear from a from a fan's uh, perspective. Now, uh, talking about long time, maybe not all the way back to 1910, but Peter has been with you uh, this entire time. Talk to me about what Peter brings to the band. What is it about your relationship, both professionally and personally, 
that that is unique and has you know he's been there in the trenches i guess what since 76 77 i mean really a long long time um just talk to me a little bit about peter yeah man he he and i were like brothers in a way you know i've known peter since he was a teenager we were both teenagers in germany and i've never really played with a different bass player except for that wacken show very briefly but you know, he's the, the one and only bass player I've ever played with. So there's a mutual understanding musically that's that's pretty unique. Um, and, you know, it's something that is not very often. And, you know, it's an amazing thing to have. There, you pretty much know what the other guy thinks without having to say it all the time. So when we listen to ideas and music, we, you know, we... we we, like I said, we we have an understanding that's almost like blind, if you want, if you, you know that. that. Yeah, I know what you mean, and, and he, he's he's been great to have around and great to watch. Also, um, you are of course on tour right now. It ends in November. There's, a, there's of course a seventy thousand tons of metal cruise coming up in January. What do we look forward to here as fans for 2019? I'm assuming a new album is is off. Uh, is not in in the offing for 2019. But what do we look at in terms of touring? Do we stop and take a break, or is there a schedule coming of here's our February dates, here's our April dates, here's our June dates? What, what sort of 2019 look, look like? Man, we've done so much touring more than ever on on, right. on this last album, Rise of Chaos. So obviously we'll have to come in to a stop at some point. But the demand has been so strong that we really stayed on the road pretty much non-stop since the album came out and we still have one more thing scheduled and that's that cruise and like you mentioned in january but after that um i think we have to focus on the new album um the only other thing that we're working on which is what i mentioned earlier is other orchestra shows they will be select cities here and there only so it, it those shows won't be like months and months of on the road, there will be more like, you know, here and there, a few shows, and that's it. Were Were you still working on plans for a documentary? Because I, I think there was, um, what was it going to be called? Anyway, there, there was talk of a documentary years ago. Is that something that, that still interests the band to do? Exceptology, yeah. Well, yes. it never really, I mean, <laughs> here's the sad truth. We started so early in the days, like in the 70s and 80s, when nobody had cell phones and camcorders and all that. So there really wasn't a whole lot of footage like we were hoping. It was basically a call to the fan community to say, hey, if you got any old footage, send us your stuff and see what's out there. And then if it if there would have been enough, we would have put together like a DVD or a documentary kind of thing. But the sad truth is there isn't much out there, you know, because like, you right. know, you remember back in those days, you weren't allowed to bring cameras in and no private person really thought about bringing a, you know, a camera to a show or record the whole show as a bootleg. This only started just basically fairly recently with cell phones and all that. But back in those days, so long story short, there isn't really a whole lot of footage. Uh, which is a which is a shame, which I would then say, well, then maybe do a documentary of changing a singer and and the whole Mark story because that that could also be fascinating. But that's that's too bad. Um, but do talk to me about about bringing Mark in back a, a few years back when you decided to re, regroup, reform, and and go back out there was a new singer. What were sort of the band's expectations? Because I think they must have been easily surpassed. You know, fans really have been turned on by this, for the lack of a better word, new lineup. Um, But what were your thoughts going in there when you said, okay, in 2009, we're going to do this. We're going to get a new guy. What were some of the challenges you faced, the the concerns you had? trying to find Mark and trying to find a new guy and just resurrecting the band. It was completely different from what you just described. It wasn't like we decided to start the band again and look for a singer and all that. It just never happened that way. We really ran into Mark by chance and decided because of that to start the band again. 
Peter and I were just doing a jam session one day in near his hometown in Philadelphia at that point, and uh, weren't even thinking about regrouping, reforming, nothing like that. We were just basically private citizens, except it was long over, except it was history. Nobody thought about any of that. And uh, Mark Tonillo happened to live close by, and somebody suggested, hey, there's this guy, Mark, he would probably like to join you for the jam session. So he, we invited him over and started jamming without thinking about anything. And then uh, immediately, as soon as he started singing, Peter and I were blown away and thought, like, here's a guy that we didn't think existed. Um, so why don't we use this as an excuse to start everything back up again? And uh, like a day later, it was announced to the world, hey, we might do this again. And even write a new album and all that kind of stuff. But it was a very spontaneous thing. And nobody at that point in the band knew exactly how it would work, if it would work, if fans would really, you know, uh, go for it, you know. And uh, we just went for it and thought we, because we were convinced and we thought, you know, this has to work. It's too good to be true. And here we are 10 years later still working together and it, and it has worked it's worked remarkably well and in fact i would suggest and maybe you can agree or not but i would suggest that blood of nations is the band's most important record and we're not talking about best or not best or 80 but most important because if that record had not been as strong if we had not had teutonic terror and 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 um uh, pandemic and all the band might not have survived. Would you agree that, that Blood of Nations really was one of the most important records in your career? Yeah, I guess you could say that. It, it probably could. Yeah, it's a fair point. Because if it, you know, like you said, if it would, it would have been a weak album and the fans wouldn't have been convinced, then, yeah, we wouldn't be here today. No, talking. No. I mean, if it had stiffed, yeah. it might have been the end right then and there. Of course, and it could have been, you know, yeah. uh, and like we we had that mindset when we went into the whole thing. We just said, let's give it all we've got. Nobody knows what the future will hold, but here's our chance to do what we love to do. And by God, why shouldn't it work if, if we, you know. And, and we knew it was going to be an uphill battle because changing lead singers is one of the hardest things in the business. And we thought, you know, if we give it, give it, give it all we've got and we write good songs, we're convinced we can do this. But we didn't know. You know, it's really up to the fans in the end. We could have given it all we've got, and still everybody would have said, nah. you yeah. know. Yeah, well, it, it turned out great. And then and just uh, finally here, we'll just we'll end with this, but you do have another creative outlet. You do do the photography. Talk to me about that passion and developing that skill. And is that something that you want to do more of in the next few years and, and take some time off, take six months off and just go be a photographer? Or is it sort of, no, accepts first. It, this is a, a really sort of fun hobby. Just just talk to me about that creative out, outlet and um, what do you do with it? Well, photography has always been a, a very serious passion of mine forever and ever. Um, but it always was number two on the scale of things for me. And it only was when music came to a halt that I thought, well, Here's the other passion in my life. Why don't I do that and do it professionally for, you know, I did it actually for over 10, 15 years. And even while Except was back up and running again, I was doing it parallel. But, you know, these last few years have been so intensive and, and we've been on the road so much that at some point I had to decide and say, hey, you know, I can't can't do everything. I can't do both. So I decided, you know, to drop the whole photography thing professionally for good and I'm full-time musician again for the last, I don't know, three, four, five years. And uh, that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm cool with that, but I still, you know, take pictures on the road for fun here and there. But, you know, it's a different story whether you do it, you know, as a hobby or professionally. So right now it's, again, just a hobby. Yeah, and a great one. And uh, I will, I actually, I, I'll ask you one more question that I just uh forgotten thought of here but um while except was on the downtime those those breaks that you had were you mm -hmm. ever were you ever approached by another band to become the guitarist the replacement guy in whatever formation 
Is that something that had come up over the years? And and if so, what sort of held you back? And and because you never really went off and and were the the new guitarist for whoever Judas Priest or Kiss or right? You've always been Wolf Hoffman of Accept. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, I've been uh, approached here and there, but you know, surprisingly, not that often. I mean, I'm not surprised myself, but. Fans are always surprised when I say that because you, you think that happens all the time that somebody's looking for a guitar player and they call you and they call everybody around. But really, I mean, it's probably also due to the fact that I'm known for one thing and that's very distinct, you know, the accept thing. And I don't think I even would have been interested, to be honest, in, in joining another band like that because I'm not that type of player, you know. Um... I'm not very versatile. I can't really switch around and, 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 and change personalities. Some players can. They can play everything you ask them to, and that's great, but that's not me. I do what I do, and that's maybe why, you know, I spend all my life playing and Accept. I've never been in another band, believe it or not. Oh, I believe it, and, and, and I'm glad for it, because Accept has had an incredible discography, an incredible legacy, and... You know, as as we move forward and as we all get older, I, I'm I'm very glad that there hasn't been an Accept Farewell tour announced yet, and I'm hoping that it's not for at least another 15 years because there's so much more to give. And and with Mark out there singing those songs, I mean, you can't complain, right? So you know, no, man. we're we're pretty much having the time of our life, and we're looking forward to many more years of touring and making albums and all that. And nobody's even thinking about retiring. I don't even know that you can retire as a musician. I no. think you're not supposed to. And, and most guys come back eventually. And I don't really know how this is going to work because I mean, what other, what else would keep you that pumped up and interested, but going on the road and touring and being on stage. I mean, this is why would you retire from that? What else would you do? There's nothing else in life that's, you know, as satisfying to me. So, I think and retirement is an, is an option. <laughs> and when you look at Symphonic Terror live at Wacken, or, or Wacken, uh, you know you, you can't imagine being retired and not having that thrill. When when eighty thousand people give you that roar and that roar of approval, yeah. that that beats any kind of day at the beach retirement. I mean, any day. Heck yeah, it's like a drug. Everybody wants it, and everybody wants some more of it, and you want it back all the time. Once you've had it, it's something that can't be explained unless you've experienced. And uh, I think that, that's why the saying, once a musician, always a musician, you can't really ever switch that off and completely forget about it. It just doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work at all. Uh, Wolf, a great pleasure. Uh, always, always uh, looking forward to talking to you. Always looking forward to new Accept music. Hopefully the band will make it to Canada on the next uh, set of dates and we'll see you either in toronto ottawa or montreal but uh until then we have symphonic terror live at wavac and out november 23rd via nuclear blast uh folks buy it once buy it twice buy one for your friend uh there you go Wolf. <laughs> right i mean thank the, you very much thank right. you sir we'll have a good day bye-bye now okay take care bye-bye cheers